Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Father, I just ask you to release the ministering spirits this morning, to minister into the heirs of salvation. Lord, I come into agreement with every need represented and every family represented in this house right now, that whatsoever is required, God, that you would say yes and amen this morning. Lord, where there's a need of healing, I release healing virtue into the room. Where there's a need of knowledge, I release a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom into the room. Where there's a need of prophecy, I release the spirit of prophecy into the room right now. God, we honor you in all that we do here. We give you praise and glory. Have your way. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come this morning, God, and let it rise up within us. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. I was attempting to go to sleep last night after we left here, and I don't know why I try to go to bed before 3 o'clock in the morning anymore in this season in my life. And struggle as I do to sit, I just sit there and tumble and tumble and turn and do everything I can do not to wake up Tina and be severely beaten in the process. But the Lord was speaking to me, and I had to get up a couple times, and I had to add a couple notes. I, some of you are probably familiar with that. The Lord will share stuff with you. Two o'clock in the morning, you'll be writing something down in your notebook, and then at three o'clock in the morning, there you go again. And it was just one of those kind of nights. But the Lord, the Holy Spirit, spoke to me in this fashion. He said, Frank, most people believe that Father God is the architect of creation. And no one will disagree with that. But did you know that he's also the draftsman? He is the one that designed the blueprints for all that is constructed today in the universe. And I said, yeah, Holy Spirit, I, I, I can agree with that. He said, did you know that if the Father is the architect and the draftsman, then Jesus Christ is the blueprint of every intention that God ever had for man to become. The Word says that in Him we live, we move, and we have our being. And that was God's ultimate intention, that every bit of everything that Jesus ever expressed of the Father, that the fullness of of him would come into each individual and each individual would come together corporately and be the full expression of everything Christ Jesus is. So that's what he's going to talk about this morning with us. And I thoroughly believe that the husbandman must be first partaker of the fruit. So I'm going to listen while I preach. And I just want you to come together and, and pray with me that God's perfect will and perfect knowledge would be just spoken out this morning, okay? If you'll go to the book of Romans, the 8th chapter... And we're going to come out of the 29th verse, and it's going to be very familiar to you. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. And it reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that he might be the firstborn among many, Many brethren, there's a key there. Now, logically, I think even the people that are not in Christ, people that don't understand who Jesus is, when they read, if they read with a little bit of knowledge, they can logically deduce that if Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren, there is a lining up, an enumeration of brethren that will follow. If he's firstborn, there has to be a secondborn. There has to be a thirdborn. There has to be a fourthborn. There has to be a people that comes into the fullness of the expression of who Jesus Christ is. Else it would say Jesus the only born among many brethren. Logically, we can deduce that, right? But we're going to break this down. I'm going to get a little bit seminary professor on you this morning. I'm going to try not to be boring or dry, but I want to break this down to such a way that we have a more perfect understanding of what God's saying. The word says, for whom he foreknew, or, fore, or foreknows. The word for foreknow literally means to foresee or to have knowledge of. Now, where can we find that in the Bible? The Bible always confirms itself. It always explains itself. The word in Jeremiah said in the first chapter, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. 
I had intimate knowledge of you. I had predestined you to become a prophet unto the nations. I had put my word within you. I had put my spirit within you. And I called you out. Your destiny is to be my prophet, my mouthpiece, Jeremiah. So in like fashion, Jesus expressed everything the Father was and is. You remember, I believe it was Philip that said, Show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus said, Have you been with me such a long time now that you do not know that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? And that is what God's intention is. That when people look at us as individuals and corporately, that they won't be able to see, say, Show us Jesus. We will give the same statement of testimony. We'll be able to say, If you have seen me, you have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have seen me, you have seen my Father. If you have seen me, you have experienced the Holy Spirit. And that's God's intention for mankind, to make us the perfect representation of everything that the kingdom of heaven is and everything that the Godhead is. So he foreknew us, not meaning that he forced his plan on us, but we all know that anybody that's been in church more than a couple years knows that there is the permissive will of God and there's the perfect will of God. And what we're speaking here today is the perfect will of God for our lives, to be the absolute expression of all that Jesus Christ is. So that what, that's what foreknow means. I have a destiny for you. I have a plan for your life. Nobody on this planet does not have a destiny. Nobody on this planet is not designed with purpose. God does not design without purpose. God is not wasteful. God doesn't even utter words, written words in his Bible that have no meaning. Let's speak about the word predestined. The word predestined here means foreordained or decreed from a time and eternity by God. God has spoken a destiny in you. He has foreordained a destiny in you from time and before memorial. When it was only God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. He pre-planned that destiny for you. A lot of us think that I have a call on my life and there is a destiny designed for me. Well, there's, there's some truth to that. But I would like to, to express it to you as a prophet would because that's my primary call in life. There was a destiny already laid out by God. There was a destiny already in the works, the greater plan of God. And God said, I need a man, I need a woman, a son or daughter that can fulfill this destiny for me. I am going to design him specifically for this line of destiny that I have. I am going to custom fit them for that destiny because nobody else after I design this person will be able to do what they can do on the planet. Nobody else on this earth will be able to speak to people like they do, will be able to minister to people like they do. They have been specifically designed for this destiny that was set in order before they were formed. So you have a destiny that was laid out that you and only you were designed for. So when we say, God, I can't obey you in this. God, I don't want to do this. God, I'm scared. You are denying yourself destiny. You are denying yourself design purpose. You're not functioning, as engineers would say, to divine, de design parameters or specification. That's the reason when we become disobedient. How many of you have ever told God no and you look back and I should have done it and then you become miserable? You're not doing what you're designed for. There's no joy in doing something other than what you're designed for. If you're called to be an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, whatever you're called to do, that's not what you are. That is who you are. That is your design function that God established within you. That's the reason I can't be happy doing anything else than being an apostle or a prophet. That's what I'm designed to do. You might not be happy being able to do anything but preach the gospel or be a pastor or be a Sunday school teacher. Whatever that design specification is, you only find your soul resting in that place because that's who you are. Not just your title. And oh, that people would recognize, hey, maybe I'm not called to do this. I'm miserable doing this. I'm not good at this. People would just realize, I want a ministry, but I don't want a ministry outside of God's destiny for my life. And there would be a lot less division and strife in the church. 
people trying to fill up holes that they're not designed to be in. The square peg in the proverbial round hole, it just does not function. And it brings discord into the body. And that's the reason there are so many miserable pastors out there. They're, I hate to say it, there are men that are trying to pastor because they want a ministry that were never called. And they're miserable. In their heart, they want to be out traveling and evangelizing and preaching the gospel. But there's security in being a pastor because most of the time in the bigger churches, there's a guaranteed paycheck. But you've got to step out in faith if you want to find destiny. Destiny is not always an easy thing to discover. And as we search out the Scriptures and we recognize who we are in Christ and the things that we love and the things that we hate, the things that we have talents with and the things that we don't, we start to recognize our design purpose if we quit lying to ourselves. Because a lot of us try to lie to ourselves, oh, I'm doing pretty good at this. And you look back at it over the years because when I started in the ministry 20-some-odd years ago, I thought I was preaching up a storm, man. I thought I knew the theology. I thought I had the doctrine right. I, had, I, I thought I had all this right. And a couple years ago, I started listening to some of the, <laughs> the t- tapes I thought were good back when I was in my early 20s and early 30s. And now that I'm in my early 40s, I look at them and I'm almost embarrassed to play them now. I just want to burn them in the fire. It's like, oh, my God, I said that? I thought that was something? But I was outside design specifications and parameters. I wasn't doing what I was designed to do. So I could not be excellent at it. I did the best I could, but I was not excellent at it because it's not what I was called to be. So to be predestined is something that is foreordained in you. It is in the marrow of your bones. It is who you are. It is the soul. It is the crux of your personality. One, one thing as being a prophetic minister, I can always recognize a prophet because there are certain personality dynamics that a prophet has. They're usually bolder, they're usually misunderstood, and they're usually seen by people that don't understand prophets as critical because the one character flaw in prophets is we will usually notice the negative before we will the positive. And that causes a lot of strife. But as you develop the gift that you have, whether it be prophet, apostle, or any of the other fivefold ministry, you will start start seeing as you mature, this part of my personality does not meet the design specification for the job I'm called to. And Jesus, if you will let him through the Holy Spirit, he will start eliminating those parts of your personality that are diametrically opposed to the call on your life. Let's talk about the word conformed. Conformed means jointly formed. The word says that we are, the body of Christ, jointly fit together, and that is corporately. All right? Every one of us, if we fit our specific design purpose, if we fit the mold, the blueprint that we're called to, the body comes together without ism, schism, or any other faction or fraction, and we are able to flow in the unity of the Spirit. God's design plan is that when we come together, since we are endowed not with the, just with the Holy Spirit upon us, but dwelling within us and Him bringing the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in us bodily within our spirit man, if we come together in that way, in purity of heart, purity of mind, pure motivations and purpose, you will find that God's design plan is for us to become the holy of holies for the New Testament. That's the reason the devil is so against the spirit of unity. When we get into the Holy of Holies, the glory comes. A lot of people say that that's the, that's the presence of the glory. No, you got it backwards. It's the glory of his presence. They're inseparable. When we come together, when the body comes together as the Holy of Holies of the New Testament, then God comes to the mercy seat in our heart and manifests in the nine spiritual gifts. The glory is released, the power is released, revelation is released, and things begin to have a spontaneity the way they do in the heavenly unseen realm. That environment is ushered to the earthly realm because it's released from a people with the love of Christ in them in the spirit of unity and nothing can block the flow or the design plan. It also says, when it says jointly formed, I want to open up the idea to you that the Word says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 
We are heirs and joint heirs. Romans 8, 17, same chapter. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, so that we may be glorified, how? Together. In unity, together. When we say that we are being glorified together with Him, it's not our glory, it's His glory. But since we are heirs and joint heirs, and members, several members of His body coming together, the glory that He has, the glory from the head flows down to the body. It talks about in the Psalms that the anointing oil flowed from Aaron's head down through his beard. When we talk about it flowing through Aaron's beard, the beard speaks of a level of maturity in relationship with God. It took a long time. Aaron was reported by um, the, the Jewish historians to have had a beard probably down to his knees. It took process of growing that beard. And only the mature men, unless you're a testosterone freak of nature like some of my friends were in high school that could grow full beards in middle school and high school, it takes a process and a time to grow that beard and mature in the things of God, right? So when the anointing comes through the head, down the body, to the beard, down to the feet of the robes, we are completely covered in His anointing. We are completely covered in His glory. We are completely covered in His presence. And that is the objective of God, to see us completely clothed in Him. So to be conformed, it means we are jointly formed. We are formed together into Christ Jesus as a body and as individuals. Here's the fun word. Image. We are conformed to the image of His Son. The word for image literally means used. It's used as this definition. Used as having a likeness and moral excellence that He has. In other words, you have mortified the deeds of the flesh. You have crucified your flesh. And like Jesus, Jesus said, I only do those things that I first see my Father do. And then he said, I only speak those things that I first hear from my Father. So when you crucify the deeds of the flesh and you are conformed to his image, you will only do those things that you hear in your spiritual ear and you will only perform those deeds that you see in your spiritual eye. How did Jesus have a 100% success rate in ministry? There's your secret. He only did what he saw the Father do. He only spoke what he heard the Father say. He was not presumptuous. He didn't jump the gun. He would wait on the Father. The second thing he would do is he would come away with the Father. See, a lot of us get involved in ministry, and we get so involved in serving God that we forget to stay and spend time with God. And it doesn't take long for a man that's running a, a major ministry or a couple churches to figure out, I'm burning out. Why am I burning out? I have not been in contact with life. Resurrection life, the only thing that can sustain me. The ministry is great, but if the ministry starts taking me away from God, I have to make a choice. I have to make a quality decision. I have to say, okay, God, this is great, but I'm not getting any life from it anymore. And if I'm not getting any life from it, they're certainly not getting any life from it because I have none to impart. Fill me, Lord. Come away with me, my beloved, the Word. The Word of God. So the image is used for moral likeness and excellence. Transformed to the most holy and blessed state of mind. The most holy and blessed state of mind. What does that remind you of? The word says in Romans 12 too, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good, that acceptable, and perfect will of God. So our mind, when it's lined up to the Word of God, when it's lined up to the will of God, we are in a blessed state of peace. What kind of peace? The Word says a peace that surpasses all understanding, and then it mentions a joy, a joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
How many of you want to dwell in that blessed state where everything can be crashing on around you? A, a thousand may fall at thy right side and ten thousand on thy other hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. You can be in the middle state that you can see where the world is headed, where it's going. You can know your relationships right with God. You can know that you're in the will of God and be in absolute peace and in the fullness of joy. Jesus said himself, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are the substance of your thought processes. Everything that goes on in your life originated from your thought processes. Even the words you speak, because the word says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everything begins in your thought life. So that's the reason we have to renew our mind regenerate our thoughts with the Word of God we have to get to the blueprint that's written in these 66 books right here this is the schematic for life this is the blueprint that the draftsman has given us to manifest Christ in our walk our talk our thoughts and our actions every day to manifest the kingdom of heaven It also means, image means the divine nature. The divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. We were just talking about the word of God. Great and precious promises. That through these, only through these promises, accepting them, by faith and letting them manifest in your life because if you don't study the word Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will take what is his and give it unto you but if you have not taken the time to study the word he has nothing to give to you he has nothing to open up revelation so if the word is not primary especially in this season if the word is not primary the Holy Spirit cannot manifest you into the mature son or daughter of God that you are destined predestined to be that through these you may be partakers of what we just talked about it two words the divine nature everything he is God wants us to become corporately and individually having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. See, the Word says that we were crucified with Him. We were reckoned dead with Him. So a dead man, guess what? A dead man, dead woman, cadavers have no lust. Dead men do not lust. Dead men do not crave. Dead men do not become jealous. Dead men do not envy. Dead men do not hate. That's the reason we have to, like I said before, mortify the deeds of the flesh because you've already been reckoned dead in Christ Jesus. Firstborn. This is going to be my favorite Greek word this morning. Firstborn. That he could be the firstborn among many brethren. The word for first, firstborn is prototakas prototakas which is the word we get the root and use it for prototype did you just hear me that word means prototype Jesus is called the firstborn he is the mold he is the prototype he is the everything the all in all that the body of Christ is supposed to come he is the I am and we can say when he says I am we can say so are we because we're in you Literally, it is the root of where we get the word prototype. It is the very blueprint and the intent of man's creation from God. Everything he is, we are to become. Firstborn among. Among would seem like a word that you would not choose to define by Greek, Hebrew, Latin, or any other thing. I know it seems insignificant. But the word among means it, it, it denotes an instrumental positioning. 
and instrumental positioning. Jesus Christ is the firstborn among. He is instrumentally positioned, not among, not just among, but in us and through us all. He is clothing upon us. He is filling us with His Spirit. He is within the body corporately, and He is within the individuals. And He is positioned in that place to be preeminent, the firstborn. First almost always means primary in position, supreme in position. And when it says He is among us, He is supreme within us. His nature is supreme within us. And it is that nature that comes exploding forth from us when we subject ourselves to the power of the Holy Ghost. So we have a blueprint that is imprinted within us, that is engrafted within us, that is inside us. And if we would just let ourselves become what God called us to be, that blueprint will start taking form. The draftsman looks when he is doing the blueprints on the drafting table. He looks and he can picture in his mind what the finished product is. And he can go beam by beam, rivet by rivet, brick by brick, wire by wire, pipe by pipe. And he can put the whole image together in his mind and he can have the finished product. Which is what God did in Christ Jesus. Every cell, every atom of Jesus' fiber is what we are to become. I can't stress that enough. There is no Baptist Jesus. There is no Methodist Jesus. There's no Pentecostal Jesus. There is just Jesus. He is the firstborn, the only born among many brethren to have the purpose of being a seed form of what we're to become. The Word says, Jesus made a statement. He said, unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it does not bring forth. But when it does die, when it does fall into the ground, it brings forth much fruit. So here is a seed. God said, as long as the earth remains, there shall be seed, time, and harvest. If we will go through the process of time and let the Holy Ghost deal with us, let Him shape us, we will find that as the seed is planted within our spirit, the time passes and ultimately there will be a harvest where we look just like Jesus. The ultimate goal of God, seed, time, and harvest, but what, what, what really tears our nerves up is that time in between the seed and the harvest, and we sit there fighting God. God, it doesn't feel good. God, I don't like this. I don't understand why you're doing this. How is this going to benefit me? We forget He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows your end from your beginning. Else how could he prophesy to Jeremiah before I formed you in your mother's womb? I called you to be a prophet unto the nations. What has God spoken in your heart? What has he prophesied? What breath of life has come into you that God has said, Hey, before I formed you in your mom's womb, I purposed you, I destined you for the call. That is the joy of living for Christ, making the discovery, the absolute discovery. I have a purpose. I have a design. That's the way I act. That's the reason I act the way I do. You have the personality you need right now to do what you're called to do. You're not a mistake. You may have some quirks that life has twisted through pain, through hurt, through injury, through people treating you badly bad experiences in church environments but ultimately if you let the Holy Spirit bring healing to that area your personality will be restored and you will have everything you need to become the minister God's called you to be well I'm not called to be the five-fold ministry we're all called the ministry we can all name the name of Jesus Christ Jesus said and these signs shall follow them that believe he didn't say the five-fold did he them that believe and if you fit the design parameter you will no matter if you've got a doctor a pastor apostle prophet evangelist whatever preceding your name as a prefix you will do the design plan and do the work of the ministry that Christ Jesus did so 
See, that's the one thing I love that God is destroying right now. God is destroying the religious spirit. Religion over the years said, we're the pastors, we're the ministers, we're the professionals, we're the trained. We'll say the word of God, we'll preach, and you say amen, and that's as far as the relationship needs to go, except for you bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. That's a religious spirit. That's the big eyes and the little U's. But there's only one big I in the body of Christ, and that is the big I am. See, Dr. Yeager will tell you this, and any, any minister with any ounce of common sense will tell you it's not about us. It's about him. My job as a minister in the fivefold ministry is to so equip you with everything that I have, pour all of myself into you that I work myself out of a job. When I have done that, I have done my job. Unfortunately, unfortunately, religion has taught people to be codependent so the pastor, the minister of God can be secure in his job position. Fear of the man has caused the people to think, okay, I can't do this. You've been pre-programmed to think, well, I can't prophesy. Why can't you? I can't lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Why can't you? Where in the Bible does it say if you don't have the five-fold title on your front name or your first name with you or the prefix to your first name that you cannot do these things? Jesus made no specific demand. He said, and you go into all the world. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Freely you have received, freely give. He did not say just you disciples. See, we have gotten away from the schematic that God said. All God's people should be doing the work of Jesus Christ. And because insecure men and women of God have taught you, no, you can't do this, you haven't been to seminary, you don't know the Bible well enough, you don't know what you're doing, maybe after 20 or 30 years, God might release you to clean the toilets. And that's the way it works in religious churches. But God is putting an end to all those things. There's coming, and you can take this as a thus saith the Lord, the time is coming that the churches that keep doing these things will not have one member in them. Because people are going to start hungering and thirsting after righteousness because the Spirit of God that's within them is going to draw them back to the truth of God's Word and they're going to go where God is. They're going to go where the anointing is. They're going to go where the glory is because they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They're tired of going to the house of God and not finding the answer. So among means he is instrumentally among us, in us, and through us. It literally means that he has given himself holy and we give ourselves holy to him. It means that we are mightily endowed with Him and we are all together in and on or among Christ Jesus. He says, Him that throws Himself upon the rock shall be broken, but Him who the rock falls on shall be ground to powder. The Word says, Christ in you. The hope of what? Glory. Christ in you. In the Greek, the word for you is understood to be in the plural form. Christ in you and among you all, working through you all, is the ultimate hope of glory revealed to a dead or dying world. When we come to this point of letting only Jesus flow through us and not churchianity, not religion, not racial prejudice, not all these things that are in the world, when they come sifted out of us, when we cleanse our hands and we say, not my will, but thy will be done, we will find that the glory of God is revealed with purpose through a people. Firstborn among many brethren. That speaks of an innumerable, incalculable multitude of brethren. A plurality of people walking around the planet just like he walked. The word says, as he is in the world, so are we. 
God's ultimate intention once again revealed. Remember how I told you the Bible always interprets itself? It always confirms itself with two or three witnesses? That's what I want to bring to you. I'm telling you this not just out of personal opinion. The Bible confirms it from the beginning. Over and over again, from the time Adam was formed, he carried a specific glory like unto God's. It says, let us make a man in our image and according to our likeness. And Jesus came as the last Adam to undo all the destruction and death that the first Adam had brought upon the planet to restore what was initially intended as our inheritance to be just like our father. Now you can look on the, in, in each individual's face here. You can see some of your mother. You can see some of your father. There might have been a favorite aunt or uncle. There might be some of the looks that, a, that show forth genetically from your grandparents' features on either side, an aunt or an uncle. But the thing is, if that is the type and shadow in the natural realm genetically, what happens to the spiritual man's DNA when God becomes our father? We will begin to look like him. We will begin to act like him. We will begin to talk like him. We will do things the way daddy does it because that's the way daddy is. That's the way daddy taught us. That's who we are. That's the way our family does it and it works fine for us. Now, I spoke earlier that God knows your end from your beginning, and I want to confirm that with word. We already spoke to the fact in Jeremiah chapter 1, I'm going to reiterate it, it says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I had knowledge of you, intimate knowledge. I was very familiar with what I designed you to be, Jeremiah. Isaiah 46, 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. The Word tells us already, speaking those things that be not as though they were. There has to be a divine agreement. The Word says unless two be in agreement, how can they walk together? Isn't that not what the word says? Can I tell you what the Hebrew word for agreement means? See, we think we got to get along to go along. That's what we do in church to keep peace, right? Well, I don't agree with it, but to keep peace, I'm going to do this, okay? That's what we've done in church forever. But that's not what it means. What it means is, the, the word for agreement in the Hebrew means to come to the appointed place at the appointed time. To come to the appointed place at the appointed time is literally what it means in the Hebrew. See, we get irritated with God because things don't go at the speed we want them to come, go at. Because we're not in agreement with God, it's not going to flow right. We're trying to dictate the pace, you're never going to get to your destination. You understand that, right? But when you surrender, we sing that song, I surrender all. We're lying. We sing that song and we say we're surrendering all, but in our spirit we want things to go faster. There's some things we don't want it to go through. There's some things we don't want to suffer. But the Word says that if we suffer with Him, to suffer with Him means that you must subject yourself to the same thing He did. I'm not talking about a literal crucifixion, although that may happen at some time in the distant future. What I am talking about is so surrendering everything that you are that you have no will of your own anymore except for His. You adopt His will as yours. So to come at the right place at the right time or the, at the specific appointed place at the appointed time for agreement, you have to realize, A, you don't set the place. So if you go to church anywhere you want to, and it's not where God puts you down, your roots told you to put down roots at, you're not at the assigned place. And that's just one example. I'm not, I'm not harking on church hoppers, okay? So don't think that. What I am saying is if you're not at the assigned place at the appointed time, you cannot be in agreement with God's word over your life because you have not positioned yourself to be in that divine place. You've got to be at the right place at the right time. How many of you have ever heard that about the Word? You've got to be at the right place at the right time. Why was he blessed? Because he was at the right place at the right time. Why is he in jail? Because he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Right? 
So to come in agreement with God, to walk in agreement with God, you've got to be where He assigned you to be at the specific time He assigned you to be there. Can't be five minutes late. He might prefer you be there a little bit early so you can be prepared. But you've got to be there at the appointed time. If you're trying to make the time of the appointment, it's, it's not a doctor's appointment, okay? It's, it's not going to the mechanic. It's not going to the dentist. You don't make this appointment. God tells you what time the appointment is, and it's your obligation to be there on time. And when you agree, yes, God, I'm going to do that. Yes, God, I'm going to be at that place at that time. You have come into the agreement of the alignment for your destiny to open up. Might not be comfortable. You're probably not going to like it at first. It's probably not going to be as magnificent as you first imagined it would be. Amen, Pastor Mike? But despise not the day of small beginnings. It's part of the design schematic. You put a building together, one board, one beam, one brick at a time. It starts out humbly. For several weeks, if you go to a construction site, it's nothing but mud. Dozers and dump trucks and front end loaders moving mud and dirt from one place to another. Clearing out a place for a building pad to be set down. For a proper foundation to be laid. And if the foundation is not proper, the whole building is at risk of falling. But then you'll notice over a couple weeks... They'll start digging the footers for the bricks. The framers will come in. And then once the frame's built, they'll start enclosing it. When you let God frame your life, the Holy Spirit starts enclosing around you, clothing upon you. But the foundation's got to be laid right for the Holy Spirit to be active and activate it in your life the way God prophesied to you it would be. But the, found, the hard part's got to come first. You've got to move the dirt. <laughs> you hear me? You've got to move the dirt. You've got to remove the dirt. The rocks, the sticks, the roots, the trash, whatever is necessary for you to lay that foundation level. You've got to be at that appointed place at the appointed time to get the beginnings. It, it says, despise not the day of small beginnings, does it not? But if you're never at the appointed place where God has allowed the building permit, listen, you can't get a, listen, you can't get a building permit for downtown Gettysburg and start building in Hagerstown, and it be a valid permit, right? You can't get a building permit for Chambersburg and then go build in Mechanicsburg. You have to build and put down roots where God says to build and put down roots. You have to be at your appointed place at the appointed time. I think Pastor Mike can tell you, when this thing started, he could see the whole vision, but my Lord, the vision took a lot longer to manifest than he ever thought it would. He told last night, there was times I wanted to quit. See, I have quit. You see how well that worked for me. There comes a time when the vision is much bigger than the man's ability to believe. And God has to do it incrementally. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Every time we repeat the prophecy over our life, every time we repeat that word of knowledge or those words that anointed minister of God spoke into our life, every time we repeat it, the vision gets stronger. It gets more vivid. The colors get brighter. Every detail becomes more specific. And we can see now that the blueprint that the draftsman and the architect has drawn, we begin to see the vision that the architect has and we begin to line up with his vision and we become a point, we come to that appointed place at the appointed time and we said, let's build this thing, Father. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. And this is God saying this. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. 
that word God has spoken into and over your life, your ministry, your family, whatever it may be, his counsel will stand, but you've got to come into a divine agreement with it. God's counsel will stand. Though heaven and earth pass away, his word will not pass away. Though all hell rages against me, I will stand on this word because right now this word is the appointed place and I'm standing on it at the appointed time and my foot shall not be moved from it. God has already said he will do all his pleasure. What is his pleasure? To transform you into the image of the firstborn. Nothing pleases the heart of the Father when we say, Lord, I just want to be like Jesus. I just, whatever it takes, God. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. I just want to be like him. And when you come to that place, you have started your first steps, and they are big steps to the de destiny that God has spelled out for your life in the divine blueprint. He speaks the end from the beginning. Can I confirm this? We're talking New Testament now. Can I confirm this in the New Testament? In the mouth of two or three witnesses. Revelation 1.8. Jesus spoke this of himself. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, we've already discussed, Father said in 46.10 of Isaiah that he declares the end from the beginning. Jesus said, I am the end and the beginning. I am the blueprint. I am the beginning. I am the institution of everything that you are to become. And I am the fruition and the complete maturity and the finishing of everything you ever will be. The Word says that in Him all things exist or consist. We already said at the beginning of the sermon, in Him we live, we move, we have our being. And when we come to that way of living, God flows in an unlimited fashion in our life. Hebrews, third witness, two, 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus. Who are we looking at? Who? Why? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now let's finish it. Most, most preachers stop there because that's what y'all know. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The word says he's made us to sit down together with Christ in the heavenlies but only if we run in and through him, if we flow in him, if we are at the appointed place at the appointed time, which is him. He is the place, he is the time. Looking unto Jesus, beholding him, and looking to study, to observe, and to learn, to be educated when we look. To understand what, what and who we're looking at. To Jesus, the author the word author is a very interesting word here. It means the originator, the designer, and the point of origin. Looking unto Jesus because he is the originator, he is the designer, and he is the point of origin, our reference point to all that we are to become. And it says the finisher. It sounds like they've already said what Jesus said in Revelation. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the what? The end. It says here that he is the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end of the matter, right? The word says what? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be what? Established. So it is evidently God's full intention that we become everything that Jesus is. As he is, so are we in the what? The world. We are to become the exact expression of everything he is. You might not look like him physically, but you can have his nature. We talked about divine nature. You can have his character. You can have his integrity. You can have his love. You can have his power manifest in your life. If you go along with design specifications because we discussed Jesus is the blueprint. First John 4 and 17. In this our love is made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in the world. Boldness in the day of judgment. How can we have boldness in the day of judgment? Say, 
I am in Christ and He is in me. I have fellowship with the Father. I am redeemed. I am blood-bought. I am spirit-filled. I am bone of His bone. I am flesh of His flesh. I am spirit of His spirit. I am my beloved and He is mine. The intention of marriage was a demonstration type and shadow by the Father of the relationship we're supposed to have with Jesus. The twain become one flesh when they leave their natural father and mother. And that's how Christ in you becomes the hope of glory. You are one flesh. The word for know in Greek or in Hebrew means about the same thing, to become intimately familiar as a husband does with the wife. And we are to know Jesus intimately. We are to press in to know everything he is. We are to become so familiar with it. We are to fall so in love with him that have you noticed in the natural that when a wife and a husband have been married a long time, they begin to have the same mannerisms physically. They begin to talk alike. They can finish each other's sentences. And they usually think the same thoughts at the same time if they're paying attention to their spouse and who they are and they truly want to know who that person is. There comes a time when you are so enraptured in the love of Jesus that you can hear the faintest movement in the Spirit, that you can hear the faintest whisper of God, that you instantly respond because of your love for Him and you want to obey Him because it pleases Him. Jesus said, I always do those things which please my Father. And a wife wants to please her husband and a husband wants to please his wife. That's what Paul said, right? So if he is our husband, we want to do those things that are pleasing to him. We want that intimacy. We want that divine connection of love which brings resurrection life to flow into our being and causes an overflow to come. You don't minister through the anointing that you have. You minister from this point from the overflow of glory. All right, our last scripture is Philippians 1.6, and this is an encouragement from brother Paul being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus if you dear brothers and sisters would come into alignment with purpose and realize I have a purpose I have an intended position of authority and relationship in the kingdom. That thing that God started in you, it doesn't matter how many years ago it was, it doesn't matter how far away you've been, if you will return to Him, if you will return to purpose, if you will to return to the blueprint of design specifications that are in Christ Jesus and are released through the seed of His Spirit, you realize you're pregnant, right? Guys, you realize you're pregnant, right? And it's, it's the stretch marks that are really aggravating you right now. When you receive the Holy Ghost, the sperma, the DNA, the seed of the Spirit went in you, and it started changing the spiritual genetics of who you were. You were once were children of darkness, but now are you children of light. The genetics, the DNA of the spirit of light and life, the pneuma, the breath of God, the Ruach Hokadesh, the Holy Ghost is indwelling you to transform you into the express image of the Son of God. Because you have to, your body, the body has to come into the glory of the head. It's an absolute must, it's a necessity. If it doesn't, you die. If, 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 if the tree is cut off from the roots, the tree dies. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. We must attach ourselves, permanently attach ourselves to everything he is and become that expression. That's God's goal for you. You might say, I don't see how it's ever going to do. I don't see how it's ever going to happen. What are the words of God saying to you today? Everyone has a divine purpose. Everyone has a divine call. Everybody has an anointing of God. It's your choice whether you fulfill it or not. God, cannot, God will not force you. He could, but he won't. Destiny 
is yours. Glory. What kind of glory? Jesus prayed. He said, Father, I pray that the glory that you gave to me, that you would give it to them. John 17. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Divine health. Prosperity God's way, not the way they preach it on TV to get your cash. Just having peace of mind would be a great thing for most of us, would it not? Pastor, is all right if I obey the Lord? Okay. See, I want you to note this. Even though this is for younger ministers or people just getting started out, even though you're up at the podium, clear things with the head of the church first before you do stuff. That's order. Thank you. Ma'am, last night when you spoke up and spoke the word of the Lord, the Lord says there are two promises that you received back when you were in your 40s that have not yet manifested. The first one was spoke of an increase of anointing in the prophetic when you got at the age you're at now. God says you have come into the due, due season where the double portion of the anointing that the prophet that you met so many years ago decreed to you shall come to pass now. You know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm saying, but God knows your story. The second one would be that there are things in your family bloodline, diseases, sicknesses, ailments, I don't know exactly what they are, God is not going to allow to be attached to you. God says, with long life will I satisfy my daughter and show her my salvation. Believe it or not, you're just now stepping into the good part of your ministry. Doors are beginning to open, and they're going to start opening even more frequently. The vision that you saw that God was going up the East Coast with this move, that is the vision that brought me to move from South Carolina to Pennsylvania. Your vision is right. It will go up the eastern seaboard, up the eastern seaboard to the top of Canada. God has never had a major move on the East Coast. We've seen Florida, we've seen Lakeland, we've seen Brownsville, but it has not been a sustained move of God. This is a move of God that will not be a revival, but it will be a manner of living. You have a gift of healing. It has not always been recognized. Matter of fact, it's been refuted because it didn't happen and then suddenly it's like people thought it should and you were ridiculed because of it. God says, I will vindicate that ministry that I have instilled within you. I will cause that ministry to grow and it will be the predominating factor of your life. The word of knowledge that you have when you pray for people because I see you laying hands on people and it's a, it's, it's, it's a proximity gift of the prophetic. I see you laying hands on them and then a word of knowledge comes. That's the way it works for you. And word of wisdom. Sometimes it's they can be this far away. They can be on the other side of the room and God will give you a word. But a more specific gift will come when you lay hands on them. And God says creative miracles are going to start happening. I see limbs, organs, eyes, ears opening, being recreated under your hand. Because God's going to vindicate you. You came from an old order that said women can't preach. Women can't minister. Women can't do this. Women can't do that. But God says, I break that yoke off your neck. And the very ones that are still alive that said these things, you can never do this. You'll have to serve someone else and maybe later. God says, I'm going to have to make it now for you that you see these people have to come to you for ministry. See, here, here's the thing. When you criticize a prophet, when you criticize a man or a woman of God, God has this sense of humor where that will be the only person you can get your healing from. That'll be the only person you can get your word from. That'll be the only person that can minister to you. There's also coming a more dynamic preaching gift. God has given you 30 and 60 fold of the word. Now he's going to give you the 100 fold. 
because you are at a stage in your life right now, ma'am, where God says you are going to become, you already are, to some women, a mother. But God says multitudes, multitudes, multitudes are coming. God bless you. Sir, stand up. The Lord says in many occasions you've been misunderstood. Many occasions you've been treated as an outcast. And on many occasions people in the church have hurt you. God says it hurt, it caused scars, but you did not become bitter. You made the same statement Jesus did. Forgive them, Lord, they don't know what they're doing. And you've said this in your prayers. God says this is the day for you to be exalted among men. This is the day for you to step out into the ministry. You have a ministry of intercession. You have a ministry of warfare. You have a ministry of worship. And you have a ministry of healing. And God opens that ministry for you this day because you have stood firm. You have stood faithful. You have proven faithful. And you have stood the test of time. Pastor Mike, come up. Come here. Come here. Lift your hands. It has so hurt you that it has caused physical manifestations of your, in your body, joint pain and digestive issues, and God is going to heal that today. Are you ready for it? Are you ready to be released into that ministry that God has for you? I see you on the streets and on the sidewalks going to those that would not be received. God trained you even though it was painful. He allowed these things to happen for you to see how the outcast feels when they come into the house of God. So, Lord, I anoint my brother's hands for the gift of healing right now in the name of Jesus. You're going to get fresh baptism, too. A new infilling. Lord, I decree healing in his digestive system and in his joints right now. Arthritis, I curse you in the name of Jesus. You must go. And, Lord, I release this new anointing, this fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Come on, let's rejoice with our brother. Brother? What's that brother's name? Daryl, will you come here, please? <clears throat> this is funny. I had no plans ministering like this. God's always got a good sense of humor, doesn't he? You have an Abraham anointing. You have waited 20 years expecting a promise. And you said, Lord, where's the promise that I had? The birthing of the ministry that you promised me. Where is the Isaac that I've been waiting for in the spirit? God says, I changed your name. I changed your nature. He says, now comes forth the promise. I have delivered you. God says, do not let the spirit of depression attach itself to you anymore. You know your authority in the spirit. Your father had depression and fought it his whole life. God said, the curse shall not come upon you or your children or your children's children from now on. God says, you are going to be free. And God says, I have raised you up, not only but for a prophetic ministry, but I am going to bless your hands with finances and make you into a facilitator for younger ministries to get started. God is making you an apostle. You've already heard this call before. I'm confirming what you heard 10 years ago. God makes you an apostle. That was the impartation. Today comes the activation. God flips the switch on. God, I release it. This started out funny because Dr. Mike called me. He said, Frank, he didn't really ask me. He kind of told me. You're preaching what day you want. How's Saturday? 10 o'clock all right with you? Fine. It was funny. I laughed about it when I hung up with you. I went to Tina. I said, you know what Mike Yeager just did to me? It's funny. You got to love him. You got to love the guy. 
Ma'am, can you come up here, please? <clears throat> You've been backed in a corner. And the Lord says, come out of the dark corner, come into my light. You were called to be a prophetess. You've known this since you were an eight-year-old little girl. Opportunities have been zero at best because the order of the system that you came out of does not recognize women, just like sister here. God says, well, this is the word last night. I'm bringing my women out of obscurity. There's also joint problems God's going to heal tonight or this morning. I'm used to ministering at night. Forgive me, Lord. I'm a nocturnal prophet. Um <clears throat> You have been functioning as a prophetic intercessor for about 25 years now. And God says he's going to release, release the breaker anointing upon you. You've been praying for that. God, give me the breaker anointing. God says you're going to get it because you've been faithful these 25 years. Now, I see about, you must have been about seven or eight years old. Jesus appeared to you in your bedroom when you were a little girl. And he called you to be a prophetess then. And that's been irritating you for God knows how long because it's just been grinding away at you. I have a destiny, but I can't get a hold of it. Men, evil men blocked you. They came in the guise of literally wolves in sheep's clothing. You, you were perceived as a woman of finances and a woman of means by them, and you were used as their meal ticket for a while. I don't know you, but that's what the Lord's telling me. God says, I will restore to your hand because you gave because you love me. I will also heal your lower back, your shoulders, and your neck. No more migraine headaches for you. And you'll be able to sleep and roll over in the bed without being woken up in pain. Have I missed it anywhere? Lift your hands. You ready to receive? Double portion of anointing and healing in Jesus' name. I just had a mini vision, Pastor. A few months, you better get some more covers. A few months from this end to that end. Laid out in the Spirit. Sovereignly. Maybe through a spoken word, but no man's going to have to lay on hands because this is going to be one of those things God is going to come and visit. Ma'am, you're the blowing, blowing the shofar. Come here. The Lord says you have a sweet spirit, but there's a lioness in you that he's trying to release. You love doing warfare, and you do it behind closed doors where nobody sees you. But God says bring that out now. You've been trained in the secret place. Now come out to the battlefield. God says, I'm going to use you to tear down the walls of spiritual Jericho in this area. God says, there is a wall that religion has built up, a spirit of religion has built up, and you despise that spirit. You have fought against that spirit for years, and you have paid dearly for it. People have misunderstood you. People have ridiculed you. People have criticized you. They think that you're granola. You know what granola is? Fruit, nut, flake. That's what they've called you. But God says, no more. God says, I'm going to take the foolish things, and I'm going to confound the mighty and the wise. God says, I'm going to take what seems weak and I'm going to pour my strength into you and you're going to tear down the enemy's camp. There are two people you've been praying for their salvation. They've been running around like crazy. I don't know if they're relatives or not, but you've been interceding for two people that have either addictions or are just out trying everything. God says that he's going to bring them back into the sheepfold. They were raised right, but they got out and got away. I don't know who it is. But God says he's going to raise them up. Secondly, God says that he is going to restore that which has been lost. Financial difficulties, over. You've, you've, you've been sowing for 10 years in other ministries and sowing and sowing and sowing, but you haven't seen a harvest. God says this is a due season, seed time harvest. Lord, I release the blessing. I release anointing. 
Lord, I break off spirits of depression. I break off the spirit of defeat right now in the name of Jesus. Low self-esteem, I curse you in the name of Jesus. Loose this woman of God. Enter in, the Lord says. Enter into my rest. Lord, I speak strength to her body. Especially her hips and her back. Right now, I decree every bulging disc be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Pain, loose this woman of God right now. Thank you, Jesus. Glorify your name. Due season, due season. Things are being birthed right now. The glory just fell again. The, the, the older generation... You've been waiting, the Lord says, you've been waiting for the manifestation of my promise. You are the Joshua's and Caleb's. See, preachers have been making the mistake for years that the next generation's going in, the next generation's going in, preaching it like the older generation isn't going in. But I'm going to tell you, Joshua and Caleb went in. You're going in. You're not going to miss. You're not going to depart and go with the Lord before it happens. You have purpose. You have purpose. Who's this young man over here? Come here. I've called you to the nations. You've heard this before. But you say, Lord, how can this thing be? When you look at your own strength, when you look at your own abilities, these things cannot be but I've called you to be my evangelist, my prophetic evangelist, and carry my gospel throughout every continent on the planet. I have not forgotten you, and I have not forgotten your father's prayers, and I will honor him because he's honored me. I am going to raise you up, and you will be a fire for this generation, a bond fire, and people will come just to see you burn, the Lord says, because you seem on the inside to be timid, you seem to be quiet, but on the inside, something's raging on you saying, I wish I had the courage to just scream, to just roar. And God says, certainly you will, because I raised you up to be a lion in this generation. And you shall break the bones of the enemy. You shall tread upon serpents and scorpions, and they shall by no means be able to hurt you, the Lord says, because I have set my mark upon you. I formed you for this, says the Lord God. You got off course, but I'm bringing you back. And time is not lost. It shall surely be restored, says the Lord. Are you ready for it? Lord, I release the prophetic mantle in this man's life. I release the evangelic mantle in this man's life. I see souls, multitudes of souls, multitudes of healings, multitudes of miracles. Ten years from now, the Lord says, you shall step into an apostolic mantle. You shall be a builder like your father. And you shall equip sons and daughters for the work of the ministry. I've not forgotten you. Lord, now I release it in Jesus' name. I have no idea what I'm saying. Have any of you prophets ever been in position, God, you better be right about this because I'm looking real stupid right now. See, people make the mistake thinking you know something before they come up or something. We have an intuition God wants us to talk to you. But usually until you get up here, we have no idea. None whatsoever. <sighs> Lord, let your glory fall in this place right now. Let your glory fall. I release joy in Jesus' name. I just release your joy. <laughs> Drink deep, the Lord says. There's healing. A merry heart doth good like a medicine. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is that your other son? Come here. <clears throat> the time will come that your father will pass the torch and the sword to you. That teaching gift is going to go through the roof. The only way I can describe it, having been a seminary teacher, is you're going to teach at a level that is Ph.D., and it's going to be pure revelation. You've been asking God to expound and open up revelation of the word to go to the hundredfold. God, God has said, you have asked for the better thing, and it shall surely come to pass. God says, don't think about the former things. Don't think about your failures. You are your own worst nightmare. You are self-critical. You are self debasing. God says no. He breaks off depression. You quit comparing yourself to your siblings. You are the one that is closest in heart to your father. You have the same vision, but you have a newness, a freshness of the vision, and God says it will come forth. Next three years are going to be crucial. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Live in the Word. Fast. Pray. Do whatever you have to do. Get in the Word. Catch away. Steal away with the Lord. And He is going to pour into you like never before. See, you think you're only going to be a teacher. I'm going to tell you, there's something that goes beyond that. You're an apostle. You and, your dad's already said this to you. Other men have already said this to you. You didn't want to believe it because you keep looking in the mirror. What did we just discuss? Looking unto Jesus. That's the image, that's the reflection you want to see when you look in the mirror from now on, okay? Lift up your hands. God, I break off depression. I break off low self-esteem. I break off a spirit of confusion. I break off a spirit of false humility. In Jesus' name, I break off the bands of limitation. And I decree he is free in Jesus' name. Father, heal the broken heart. Loose your son from the bands of wickedness that the enemy has placed on his mind. You thought you were stupid. You better get your IQ checked again. Triple digits. There are things you don't understand. There are things I don't understand. But you're not stupid. You are geared for service to God. You're not going to conform to the things of the world. You're not going to fit in. Quit trying. Please quit trying. It's never going to work for you. It never worked for me. It never worked for your dad. God has set you apart from your mother's womb. You are sanctified. You are his. And you might as well get used to it. Lord, I release the anointing upon this young man right now. Revelation of the word of God. Lord, I impart the apostolic mantle. And in due season, you will activate it, God. I release it in the name of Jesus right now. I thank you for his life, and I decree that the broken places within his spirit are healed now. There, now I'm not trying to call out your laundry. There is a failed relationship you haven't gotten over. It's a friendship. I don't know. One of your friends or a church relation hurt your feelings, something you said, and it has wounded you. You might not even remember it. You were young, very young, a little boy. And somebody spoke something harsh to you, and that's a seed that is coming to your life. Lord, I break the seed. I break its power right now. We knock the roots out of this thing right now in the name of Jesus. And we release him into the freedom of the Spirit right now in his mind and in his soul that his emotions will no longer bring him pain, but, Lord, that you would bring him joy and fullness of joy in Jesus' name. Be at peace. Don't be afraid to be happy. Nobody's going to take it from you. That's been your biggest issue. You've been afraid. If I enjoy myself, somebody's going to take it from me. Nobody can take this from you. It's within you. Now let it come on the outside because you're going to be absolutely radical. All your kids are going to be radical. God bless you. Stand behind this one again. Both of you. Stand behind.
I think I see the problem. These boys are far too intellectual for their own good. They have to think about stuff. Yeah, analytical like their mother. I like how you put that on the mom. And you're the worst of all the kids about it. You've got to think things out. <laughs> God's going to go against your nature and turn you into another man. You're going to flow in the spirit and not out of your mind first. He's going to do to you what he did to me. Things, that proce things don't even process in my mind anymore. It's just a straight flow. You're not going to have time to think about it. You're just going to do. It's not the hearers of the word, but the doers. Lord, I release this in him in Jesus' name. New spirit, new strength, new faith in Jesus' name, new vitality in you, brand new power, and peace. Mm, thank you, Jesus. I keep hearing it's finished. It's finished in you. God's going to do it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The young lady with the red hair. Will you come up here, please? Stop there because that's where your angel showed up. There's been a waiting for a release of the power in your life and ministry. And God has made you a spiritual powerhouse for healing. And you also are a dreamer of dreams, the Lord says. And you have many visions, but you don't quite understand what you're seeing. God says, I will bring and define what you're seeing. And I'm going to release a power. There's some things that are going to line up in your emotional realm that's going to bring healing and bring a stability in your life where you're not up and down, up and down, up and down. God's going to heal that in your life. And God, I want you to release the word of promise that's been spoken over her already. The, the things she's been waiting on for so long that have been spoken to her life. I ask for a release. Lord, I break the curse of witchcraft that's spoken over her. I break the Jezebel spirit that's tried to manipulate her right now in the name of Jesus. And I break off every curse, every generational curse in Jesus' name. And I release your power into her life. I thank you for it, Lord. Lord, I pray the spirit that battles her mind, that battles her emotions right now, I cut you off in Jesus' name. I decree freedom in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Peace of mind, peace of mind, peace of mind in Jesus' name. God bless you. Ma'am, you in the pink shirt. I'm, I'm, we're almost done. Now you have the gift of joy. But you haven't really touched it like it really is within you. God says you're going to minister healing through the overflow of that joy. You have joy for yourself, but now there's going to be the overflow. There's going to be the double portion, the Lord says, and you're going to step into it. There is a ministry where you write down psalms for the Lord. God's going to cause you to start writing down prophetic poems. And it's going to be an unusual gift because there's not many called to that. I see you up in the night hours, and you're one of those people that jots down the ideas that God gives you. And God says some of the ideas are going to start coming to pass now. Things that I've shared with you over the years, they're going to start coming into fruition. I see you honestly ministering joy and healing to people on the streets. You want to get outside the four walls. And God said, well done. He said, I've got enough people inside the four walls. He says, I want you to go out and stretch out your arms of compassion to people. When you see people hurting, sick, or in pain, your heart almost feels like it's ripping in you. God says that is the gift of compassion that I am coupling with the gift of healing. He says, I will honor that gift. When you feel that, immediately respond, and I will bring forth the results that you've been praying for. You ready for it? Lift your hands. Lord, as I've spoken it, so I release it in Jesus' name.
How many of you have a teaching anointing in here? I don't know why I focused in on you first. I was wanting to tell you this earlier, but I had to make sure. There is a shepherd's heart within you. And you have studied the word for countless years. And it is stored in you. I see you like a grain silo. You have been laid in place and put in storage for these many years because like her, God is raising you up to be a father to sow seed into young men and to raise up spiritually sound teachers of the gospel. Now you've seen people that taught the word and it grieved your spirit when it was done incorrectly or out of context. It grieves you. And God says, that was my spirit confirming the call on your life that you shall be a plumb line as a teacher of the word. And God says, it starts now. He releases it in you now. You've waited long enough. Lord, I bless him and I release this word in Jesus' name. Let it be activated. You were told years ago you were going to be a teacher. And in a limited capacity, you have done this. But God takes the limits off of you today. In Jesus' name, I release it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to pray for you and your wife, Pastor. Brother, your teaching ministry is going to open up too. You are a shepherd of shepherds. God is going to send pastors for you to train. You have a pastor's heart, and you're going to minister that heart of compassion to these young men. Because the love of some, the word says, has waxed cold. And you're going to rekindle the compassion in these men. And you're going to show them what it means to be a shepherd, to watch over the sheep. Because God says, you have it. You understand it. You have my heart. You are like David to me. You sit there with your own sheep in your own little place in the world, singing unto me, not caring what it amounts to, just as long as you get to spend time with me and do what I've called you to do. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. I am going to increase, I'm going to expand the pegs of your tent now, he says. The worship anointing is going to increase to a prophetic level now in your life. You're a prophetess, although you don't get recognized as much for that. Mostly you're just seen as, oh, that's Mike's wife. But God's calling you out of obscurity. You're the first one he will call out of obscurity because it flows down from headship. God's going to increase the anointing for worship. And you've been asking God, I want to go into the place behind the veil. God says, I've rent the veil. You can enter in at any time. You have access. I grant it to you. You have permission to enter in. I want you to lift your hands. God's also cursing the spirit of weariness. And he's going to bring resurrection life into your body. Lord, as I've said it, so let it be in Jesus' name. <sighs> Receive the breath of the Spirit. Pastor, the word of the Lord is that you have been in the dark places. You have seen just about everything that a pastor can see. And you don't criticize. You don't judge. But you literally do what the word commands, that we pray for one another. You have a humble spirit. And God says, I'm in this season activating the apostolic mantle in your life as never before. He said, you have made these doors open according to my command. You have become a facilitator. He said, you have sown and scattered much seed, and this is the due season for the harvest to come back. You've been waiting many years, and God says you have been faithful with your whole house, even at the cost of some family members calling you crazy and not wanting to talk to you anymore. God says, I restore all, and I restore your reputation in your name. God says, I will give you a name in this region. He said, because I have not only made you a local apostle, I am making you a regional apostle. God says, I give you Pennsylvania. I see you in southern New Jersey, too. You've already seen this, too. 
And what's funny, I also see you going to South Florida. I don't know why God calls this a region, but I see you going to South Florida for some reason. You're going to impart something to a, a man or a woman in South, in South Florida. The vision you have. And the Lord's going to increase the healing and miracle anointing in your life. You've been saying, God, I, I enjoy this, but God, I need to feel more power. That's exactly what you said. I need to see more of the manifestations of the Spirit. And God said, this is due season. He says, I've raised you up to be one of the fathers. He said, you may have 10,000 instructors, but you have not many fathers. God says, you have passed the test to be a father now. And Lord, I release it in Jesus' name. There will be other praise teams come in here and help take the burden off you, the Lord says. I'm probably even going to bring my praise team in here to help. Let's just stand and let's thank the Lord for everything he's done. Lord, I just released the oil of joy. I just release it to your people now. Release your peace to your people in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that you've glorified your name in this house. It's all you, Lord. It's all you, none of us. We praise you for it, Lord. We praise you for it. You are the most high God. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We give you honor and glory. We thank you. Have you enjoyed the Lord this morning? Praise God. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Mike if he can. Woo. The Lord says, as you have been the first speaker, what you have said and done, and the revelation that you brought forth today is a seed of and he will bring forth the harvest because the word as it goes forth is truly the manifestation of the sons of God. And this is what your message has been. And as it is aired and taken forth through the video and the DVDs and by the word of mouth, this word will grow and be released into a further, this is a kernel of truth, but I see it as a full blown plant now, tree, whatever you want to call it. And, and because you've released it here as the first meeting, I was waiting to see what this first me message was going to be. And I, the father's heart and my heart as the mother, one of the mothers of this ministry, is pleased because you have been obedient to hear the word of God and to deliver it. And the Lord says the seed also of the ministry that has gone forth today is monumental because this is the heart of God to prepare his people and to recognize his people and that they know who they are as sons and daughters of God. So in Jesus' name, I just want to bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let that gift continue and increase, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. We bless him and his household. And we bless the, the word of his lips and the anointing that is upon his life, Father. And we call him into a higher level of apostolic prophetic anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a wonderful hand clap. Hmm? Sister Mary suggests I pray over you, brother, so I'll just pray a very simple prayer. Father, I just thank you for my brother and his precious wife and for their labor of love and their endurance. Only you know what they've endured, what they've gone through, the tests, the trials, the fire. But Father, I see them like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the burning fire because of their commitment to you. And, but Lord, I see the fourth man in there with them. Lord, I, bring, I thank you as they come out of that fire. Yes, it's, it's a spiritual fire, but it's a natural fire. But as they come out of that fire, Lord, you will cause them to be blessed and exalted to exalt the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for an increase now. And we thank you, Lord, for a, a deeper, Lord, I just sense you're doing a deep, deep 
co connection with us and them and many others coming, Lord, and that we will be the body, we will be the family, we will be the bride of Christ, and we are, we are, we are, since the enemies try to keep us separated. But, Lord, thank you, Father, he has not succeeded in Jesus' name. Amen. And I agree with Sister, Sister Billy, that was the word. I believe every meeting would be the word of the Lord. I, I said this here a couple of weeks ago. I said, I believe the Spirit of God is going to be so strong here. that, And don't misunderstand this, Pastor Frank. That if we had pulled a mule up here or a donkey, he'd begin to preach. Because people have said, well, what if they preach the wrong stuff? I said, I believe the Holy Ghost. Remember King Saul, when he got among the prophets, even though he had a heart of a murderer, he began to prophesy under the Holy Ghost. So I said, Lord, let that be that. And so this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we have another meeting. And then tonight at 7 o'clock. And at 